All right. So it looks like we're live. Um, so you guys check me out, make sure the sound's working. We are using a new platform. So I um, this is a new experience for me, but I, I like this platform, StreamYard. It was actually recommended by one of my podcast guests. Um, so we definitely want to give thanks to that. And we'll get through it. Some of my first podcasts, some of my first live sessions, uh, we didn't have sound. We didn't have video quality. So um, like you said, thanks, Denzel. Welcome. Maria, welcome. Nikki, I know how to read your name now. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Marcia, thank you for joining us today. Sounds great so far. Excellent. MJ, okay. Uh, I want to welcome a man, Eli. Thank you, Eli, for coming today. Sure, man. Thanks for having me. You know, so uh, Eli, actually, uh, we've been talking for, oof, how far is, I'm going to look at this email. This email that he sent me um, dates back to 2019. <laughs> right. 2019. That's a year and a half into us knowing each other. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, but Eli has always been talking to me about um, commercial real estate and uh, I've never... I mean, I've looked into it, but I've never gone past looking at it. So, uh, but before we get started, uh, definitely everyone, it's been a while since um, we've gone live and I just want to let folks know out there, Eli, your screen keeps going green. I don't know what happened, brother, yeah, okay. just FYI. Um, but for everyone out there watching, uh, definitely let us know, you know, uh, where you're from, your industry that you're in, uh, let us know the, the industry uh, and where you're from, the city that you're in, so that we can see and connect with other people. Use this as a session to where, for example, uh, if we were in an actual uh, live conference, it would be the equivalent of standing up and telling people a little bit about yourself. Not a big blurb. Hey, my name is Jeff. I'm in Chicago. I'm in the construction space. And for some of you, we do have your names, but for others, we don't have their names. So um, welcome Bridget. Welcome Yvette. Welcome Denzel, Candice. Uh, welcome everyone out there. And so today actually is, it's a non-government contracting topic, but, um, to me, it's related in a sense that, um, uh, there are all people out here that have, uh, skill sets, have knowledge and have experiences that we don't have. And since, I've always been very curious about commercial real estate and I've known Eli for several years that, that he's heavily involved in commercial real estate. In fact, he's invited me uh, on some deals. He sent me emails and letting him know as he's progressing. Um, I decided rather than talk to him alone on my own and like a private zoom call that I would talk to him in public and then share it with all you guys. So I hope that everyone out here watching uh, appreciates that. Make sure again, you give us a thumbs up. Uh, hit the like button on it because that's how the social media gods take care of us. And that's how we continue to spread the good word. And also, Eli, uh, make sure, you know, you drop your information for folks to contact you afterwards. So some people got to run. And um, so in case of those folks that are not available afterwards, Eli, just let me know what information you want me to drop in the chat and I will do so. So, sure. all right. And as always, if you have any questions throughout Feel free to drop the questions in there. Um, welcome, Johnny. Welcome, Eric Harrison. Um, and we are actually streaming both on Facebook and YouTube. So let's see how that goes. So, Eli, introduce yourself, brother. Tell us about a little bit about yourself, uh, where you come from. How did you get into this world? And, um, you know, let the folks know who you are and what you do and things like that. Sure, sure. Thanks for the opportunity, Eric, to share with your crew. Uh, my name is Eli LaSalle, originally from New York. I, um, quick story, I, you know, I was uh, growing up, I used to watch a lot of PBS because, well, quite frankly, I didn't have, we didn't have cable growing up. And uh, we used to watch a lot of war movies and, you know, airplanes having dogfights in the air, dropping missiles, that kind of stuff always fascinated me. And so uh, my dream ended up becoming, I wanted to become an Air Force pilot just like the documentaries that I was watching. And so after high school, you know, I made a beeline to the military, the armed services office, and I took the exam 
And uh, once, I, you know, I, I finished the exam, the recruiters they came over to me and they were saying, man, you, you did really well. You know, you can select anything you want to do really in the military. What do you want to do? And I said, I want to be an Air Force pilot. And uh, they looked at me and they said, well, do you have 2020 vision? And I said, no, I don't. And they said, well, you can't be an Air Force pilot, son. And uh, man, I, I was just like that. You know, my childhood dreams growing up was just shot down in the sky like the aircraft pilot I wanted to be. And so, you know, I was, I was down. And so I just took myself to college aimlessly in a way. And, uh, and in college, I met a mentor and he recommended that I take, that I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I'm sure a lot of you have read. And it was quite formative to my DNA, that book was. So much so that I ended up changing my major from liberal arts to finance. And then I ended up doing real estate as a minor. Okay. And so I finished college and uh, side note, taking real estate as a minor, they didn't teach me a bit about flipping houses or doing anything that was actually for my personal development. It was all on how to balance a real estate corporations, books and that sort of thing. So anyway, um, I started, you know, I was a realtor when I was still in college. So I was really passionate about real estate and it was really uh, becoming of me. And so when I graduated, I started submitting offers on, on properties. And, uh, you know, this was in New York, early 2000s. We were looking at duplexes for like $200,000. Wow. You know, and this is in Queens too, not, you know, in, in upstate. And so finally around 2007, I ended up, we ended up buying a threeplex in a city, in an area known as Red Hook, which was at that time gentrifying. It's, you go off a few blocks from the, uh, the area of the property that I purchased, uh, you have one of the nicest, clearest views of the Statue of Liberty. It's right there on the Brooklyn, sort of on the coast. Statue of Liberty is right there. And so great, right? So, you know, we, we put our hard hats on and we started looking at, you know, construction and renovations and that sort of thing. And after a few weeks, you know, our project was ongoing. We needed some more money. And so we, we were supposed to have lines of credit, but because of the whole financial uh, you know, disaster that occurred when, you know, Lehman Brothers and all those other companies were doing their nefarious dealings. Uh, the bank that we were banking with, they froze our credit lines. So we couldn't take out a single penny. And because of that, we couldn't finish the renovation. Uh, they ended up just taking money from us and we were, we were screwed. And so a few years later, I ended up uh, filing for bankruptcy because that mortgage, you know, was on my credit. And it was a tough time for me. You know, I was definitely down in the dumps and that lasted a while. And then finally, I just said, you know what? Um, I was at that time, I, I moved to Florida and I just said, let me just pick myself up and, and do something about this. And I decided to learn the game the real way versus just buying a property and sort of hoping that it would appreciate over the course of time. And so I joined what's known as a real estate investment association. If anyone is interested in, in getting into the real estate business, I would strongly recommend every city has a, at least a chapter or two. And it was a great place to meet incredible networking. It was um, amazing knowledge, workshops, seminars on a regular basis. And I took advantage of all of that. I just became sort of a, you know, a, uh, a gym rat, if you will, when it came to the real estate business. Um, and shortly thereafter, I met a partner from the Real Estate Investment Association. Uh, we pulled together $195,000. We ended up buying a 16 unit. This is crazy prices still. And, um, you know, that one still in my portfolio, still going well. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, um, I just started buying, you know, more and more properties from fourplexes. I did a few, you know, some flips uh, during the teens. Um, and all the way up until now, where I own about 207 doors, um, we just closed on a 12 unit last Monday, as a matter of fact, um, in Volusia County, that's, you know, East coast of Florida. And, um, you know, it's just at a point where because of the foundation that I built, uh, taking a lot of education, a lot of courses, I have a, a wide resource or tool belt to choose from. So when a deal comes my way, you know, I know exactly how to approach it and to uh, and to buy. All right. Now, you said a whole mouthful in that you know, seven minute spill. Um, I'm sure people have questions out there. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to start off with uh, Real Estate Investment Association. Um, 
everyone out there heard of Real Estate Investment Association. Um, just kind of put up on the screen. Um, Eli, how do we find our local Real Estate Investment Association, first and foremost? Um, easiest Google way it. is just Google Rio and then your city, okay. you know, okay. from just your city, because every major city has got one from Cincinnati to Vegas, okay. everyone's got one. Okay. All right. So now, um, what's what I like about your story is that you said that you went bankrupt, you had filed bankruptcy, right? Right. And so, you know, again, it's interesting because so many people think that they're, you know, because of a felony, because of bankruptcy, because of their past history, right? That's an indication of their future success or lack thereof. And so how is it that um, even with a bankruptcy that you were able to, to buy property? Wow. So, you know, first of all, the reason I shared that story, Eric, was for that very same reason, because folks think or, or tend to assume that because they have a hardship in their past or in their immediate past, they're unable to recover from it. And that's, you know, the, the opposite really holds true. So at that time, when I filed for the bankruptcy, I couldn't get a traditional loan. So I missed out on a ton of deals that if I would have gotten a regular traditional loan from a regular bank, I would have been able to finesse. So without that, that's when, you know, the Real Estate Investment Association taught me how to buy properties creatively. That's what they call it. And so I just took a bunch of different classes on um, buying a property subject to the mortgage, uh, buying a property with owner financing the mortgage, uh, buying properties at tax deed sales, um, just a bunch of different methods to buy a property. And that's what you have to do. You have to get a little creative. Uh, in order to overcome that obstacle because you know you can't just sit there and wait seven years until it comes off your credit or you know four mm -hmm. years that's I mean, by that time you have missed the entire uh the discounts well it's um I, I love that because again you didn't give up you didn't throw in a towel you didn't quit um so the join the real estate investment association is is that the place where um, they gave you information on courses that you could take. Is that where you learn about the courses that you could take? Correct. Correct. Now. Yeah. yeah. And nowadays, I mean, and, and there, you know, maybe three, four hour seminars they would have over the weekend okay. on Saturdays, you know, sometimes you would do trips to certain places to maybe the tax deed office to look at the records, things of that nature. Right. So it was real hands on. And for me, that's how, I mean, I learned really well in the experiential way. Now. Uh, and I love that. How, how much this, if you remember, I know it's it's probably it was ten years ago or it's seven years ago, but um, how long ago was this that you start when the Real Estate Investment Corporation when you moved to Florida? How long ago was that? Um, that was about 2011. Okay, all right, so ten years ago. All right, mm -hmm. so at that time, what what did the courses cost? Like, what were the price ranges for the courses? So membership in mine was 150, and that mm -hmm. covered 150 dollars. 150 dollars, correct? Okay, for that was for the entire year. For a whole year, and the entire year, and, and that's three sixty five, not a calendar year. So three sixty five from when you signed up, and then you could most of the weekend programs were twenty dollars, thirty dollars, <laughs> and fifty was a heck of a course, but it wasn't much. And honestly, every dollar was worth it ten times. Fifty dollars, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what was their incentive if they're only charging fifty dollars for a course? I think it was they, they had several people sign up and okay. usually the people who who carried it out were just enthusiasts who were that was like a little side hustle for them anyway. So they did well in volume. So and it's usually the similar pricing throughout the country, with the exceptions of, of course, you know, New York, maybe Cali, those places might be more expensive. You know, um, I'm typing something in the chat. Um, now, something that you didn't mention um, that I have the privilege of knowing, um, the deal you bought your first, okay, you said you put the 195000 together and you went after this other deal, but right. you bought a deal on your own, a creative financing deal first that, that oh, you yeah. flipped and sold the money. Tell us about that deal. Man, so this was, <laughs> yeah, this was after the uh, that first 16 unit that I purchased. Um, I ended up going, taking the coaching class. Matter of fact, uh, the guy charged us $5,000 to learn how to buy a property with seller financing at 0% interest. Okay.
can. And that's a really important part because that's really the key part of the deal. Uh, he used to always say, um, you know, if I sold you, if I sold you a house for a million dollars, would you be able to afford it? Right. That's kind of like his his uh, beginning statement at the beginning of the class. And everyone's like, oh, probably not. And he said, well, if we created terms such that it made the deal more affordable, for example, it's a million dollars, but you pay ten dollars a month for the next 20 years and then, you know, some other contingency comes in on the back end. And then he asked the same question. And I think then you started to sort of open your mind and say, okay, well, if you have, if you can finagle some terms on the deal that are favorable to you buying the property, then you might be able to afford that million dollar house. And so that was the whole idea. And um, this was um, a strategy where you were pretty much just submitting contracts to realtors in order to find those motivated sellers that were willing, that had a specific problem that you could solve. But it's not always easy. People aren't just, you know, standing outside of their homes, trying to wave you down saying, hey, come by my house. Instead, it's more like you have to look at so many properties on MLS, which is the multiple listing service for real estate, um, submitting offers to realtors. I was, I submitted over two, almost 250 offers. And uh, I still have the receipts in my folders if, you know, you want to see them. And uh, hold on, wait. He said he submitted 250 offers. I just want right. you guys to hear that. Yeah, he submitted I mean, 250 offers. I mean, I would, I would I would send so many, I would make mistakes. Realtors would look at him and say, This is you're a fool. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm not working with you. Leave me alone. And I'd have to right. find another realtor. And realtors and investors have sometimes a contentious relationship, so it's not always easy. But I mean, that's the stuff you got to overcome on the road. And uh, finally, I was online on realtor.com and I saw a fourplex that I liked. The guy was selling it for 75000 and I was like, sweet. So, you know, I submitted an offer and it wasn't traditional financing. It was, uh, I would give him a 10% down payment. Um, I would give him payments every month for 10 years. And then at the end of the 10th year, it would be a balloon payment. And so he countered back. His only catching point was he wanted twenty thousand dollars. That was his only thing. He agreed to everything else. He didn't want. He didn't charge any interest on this loan. It was ten years. My monthly payment was three hundred and fifty dollars, <laughs> and it's fourplex. It's a fourplex, and uh, you know we closed. We signed off on the dotted line, and that was sort of my crown jewel right there. Eli, you gotta go slow, man. You're going too fast. <laughs> Say it, wait. So. You found a guy had a fourplex for sale for seventy five thousand, right? And you offered to for him to finance it for you. Correct. He was the bank, and he was he was going to be the bank to finance the deal that he was selling to you. Correct. And then you were going to give him ten percent down. Correct. He negotiated twenty grand down. Which right, but originally you offered him ten percent down. Correct. Ten percent down. Right. Okay, which is seventy five hundred. Yeah. And then you were going to pay some kind of interest, whatever. No, whatever. no, no, no. I never offered interest. Never. Oh, you never offered interest? That's what the court thought. You pay five grand to learn, don't offer interest ever. Oh, really? Okay, so you don't offer interest? No, you just don't. Now, if they come back and they ask for it, then, you, you know, you give it to them. Okay, so you said, all right, I'm going to give you 10% down. Correct. You finance it, and I'll pay you this much a month? Correct. And then I'll have a balloon payment in five years? In 10 years. Oh, 10 years. Okay, even better. So it's more manageable. Sure. And he said, <laughs> okay, fine. Just give me 20000 Correct. Correct. And okay. then the payment was 400 bucks. I did the inspection. The roof was a little shaky. So I said, you know, instead of 400 a month, I'll give you 350 a month. And he said, right. okay. He just wanted 20 grand. He was in a jam of some sort and he needed to get out. So I was there to help. Oh, man. I, I, I don't know. And again, I love that story. Um, <laughs> you know, I love that. And because again, I even, you know, my ignorant self thought you would charge, you offered them some interest. <laughs> right. You, I mean, if his, his motivation level de de determined that he, he didn't even, I don't even know if he acknowledged it or if he cared about it at that time. He just wanted right. it. But usually if it's a more advanced seller, they'll ask for it. And so you oblige at that time. You start off low, of course, to meet him somewhere in the middle. Wow. Okay. So now, so that's, that was your crown jewel deal, which 
I love your crown jewel, Joe. I mean, for that, I think everyone should give us a, a thumbs up on that. <laughs> that should hit the like button right there. All right, so now you, that's the crown jewel deal. All right, so you're in this class. You take these courses, these $50 courses, $100 courses. Um, you went onto this one that was a little bit more expensive. It was $5,000. But right. you did a you bought a four-unit building for twenty grand. that um, you said still in your portfolio. What is that building worth today? Um, it's worth about two seventy, two eighty. dollars okay. So you paid seventy five thousand, and it's worth about two seventy five. So you got two hundred thousand equity. Correct. I did. I mean, I did a good amount of work. Maybe you know another thirty, forty grand worth of work. Sure. All right. So one hundred fifty, one hundred seventy five thousand. Correct. Equity. Um, it's, it's probably. What do you owe on it? Um, I actually refinanced it. I refinanced ah, it recently. And used it some other deals. Correct. So I can use that money for other deals. All right. So, Sweet. Yeah. 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 And and in between, I mean, I did courses, uh, for example, tax deed investing or tax lien investing. I think that's a great option um, for people who honestly, when the, when the county takes over the taxes, it pretty much eliminates all the other liens on the property. Oh, man. Um, so at, when you get the, if you buy the property at a tax lien, at a tax deed sale, then you pretty much own it free and clear, usually for a discounted price. And um, I examined that for a while. I, I didn't like the fact that you had to buy the, buy the property sight unseen, which meant you have to buy without ever touring the house inside. Sure. And the lady who gave the class, she said, you know, you could always just go out to the property and just look around, and, you know, the windows and you can get a glimpse inside. And I just thought, nah, you know, I don't feel comfortable right. going to right. this random house in a random neighborhood looking in the windows. It's not going to look good. So right. I left that alone. Right. All right. So now let's go back. OK, so now you do that deal. Right. And then you meet a partner in the real estate investment course and real estate investment association. Correct. Okay? Um, let me put that back on the screen just for people who missed it, who are just joining us now. By the way, there's 48 people on. Give us, make sure you give us a thumbs up. Please like this video. Um, one of the first things that Eli mentioned was the, after uh, he came from New York, moved to Florida, he joined a real estate investment association, took some courses that were 50 bucks, a hundred bucks, weekend courses, two or three hour courses. Then you said you met a partner. <clears throat> now, most people are afraid of that word partner. So how did you like, you know, like be comfortable with this guy or girl? I don't know what it is. Person. So sure. It's a gentleman. And I met him. All of my partners, I've met him at the Real Estate Association. So that tells you the quality of the bonds and the friendships, relationships sure. that you make there. And so he just we just kind of took to each other. I think our energies were on the same vibes. We're on the same, you know, sort of wavelength, if you will. And usually when you're at these seminars, I mean, you're at them for quite some time, you usually see the same people and you end up, you know, building relationships with people uh, from them. And so um, he and I just, you know, over the years got cool. I think he always saw me as a viable partner for something. He ended up in, um, inviting me to his wedding, you yeah, know, wow. so he invited me to his home for barbecues. I mean, we became, you know, somewhat close. Sure. And so finally, um, uh, matter of fact, we purchased, um, I found a deal from a wholesaler. It was a 38 unit deal up in South Georgia. And, you know, we were a little, we weren't too sure if wholesalers were the route to go. If they were, um, some of them have some uns unscrupulous ways that give all investors a bad um, image. But, you know, we went through with it and um, we ended up uh, having, like at that time, I was uh, an employee. I had a job and I made fairly decent money and we ended up just, you know, pooling our money together, he and I, and we bought the 38 unit deal together. Um, that one was quite the, it was, it was quite the renovation. It was 38 units at the time. I think 14 units were occupied. Okay. I think there was, you know, there was drug activity in there not everybody wanted to pay rent. Um, and we hired a management company and it really helped us. And we had a, man a construction crew come in. We did all, we did all of the, um, the apartments. We renovated all the apartments. I lived in the building for about two months managing the renovation. And I was in South Georgia. I mean, it was different to me, but you know, after a while I got used to it, it was all right. And, um, yeah, we just got cool. And from there we ended up using that story of that particular project, which was a success, we went back to the RIA and we presented at what's called the deal of the month. 
Okay. And at the deal of the month, you know, there's a big audience. People are really enamored by what you're doing. And there was a couple of other people who reached out to us and said, hey, we like what you guys are doing. We want to, you know, in a way we're loaded and we want to make sure we want to invest with you guys in the future. And so we just put that in our back pockets and just continue to look for more deals for them to get into with us. That's great. That's great. All right. Let's uh, let's talk about one of the deals that you actually sent me. Uh, now, I know it's been a few years, so um, let's um, you, let me put this question on the screen first before we get into the deal. M. Sway says, can we use a 5014 program for commercial deals? 504 program. Can you can you expand on that some? I'm not I'm not familiar with the 504. OK, expand on the question. All right. So let's let's talk about. Okay, let's put this up on the screen. And this is uh, something that you sent me. Correct. This deal that you were looking at back in 2019 uh, was a $9 million deal. Now, did you end up buying this one? Yes, this is the okay. one that we ended up buying. Okay, so this one you bought. And then uh, this Georgetown one you did not buy, correct? Correct. And it was actually from the same seller. So we were trying to buy both. Okay. However... Due to the at the price point, it was one was eight and a half million and the other one was four point nine. And we just couldn't get to buy or raise the initial investment for both properties. So we let the Georgetown go, which is the smaller of the two. I think it was okay. 70 units. And okay. the uh, Sable Court is 129 units in Tallahassee. And we ended up pulling the trigger on this one. All right. So let's let's talk about this. Um, and it's funny. I, I don't actually have. I have the email, but I don't know how to share it yet. But Eli actually sent me an email um, with this deal that he sent out. In fact, hold on, I do have it. Um, you know, I'm going to pull up the email just so I can give some context for folks out there. Give me a second. Let me pull up this email. Just so people can have context. Okay. Huh. I don't see it on my screen. Okay. Looks like it's trying to load. There it is. All right. There it is. It was a little slow. All right, so actually, so Eli sent me this email um, back in 2019, and on here he mentioned this Georgetown apartment deal, 60-unit complex, Tallahassee, two miles of Florida State University, half a mile from Whole Foods. Asking price is five million. Our strike price is 4.3 million. Range we're submitting uh, a lot of ventures today. Goal is to raise 1.1 million to cover down payment, closing costs. It's where you come in. He's a sack an Excel. Um, 2018, 2019 income statement, a pro forma, and some links with pictures. And then he mentioned a second deal. Okay. And there it is. So that's the email that he sent out. And so we'll show you the info sheets that he sent with that. So why don't you talk to us about this email and how that works, Eli, while I pull up the info sheets? Sure, sure. So um, the goal was to raise money for the down payment. And, you know, we, those few gentlemen that we met at the Real Estate Investment Association, they came in, they were pretty liquid, but, you know, the goal at that point was 1.1 for the Georgetown and it was 2.9 for the, the, the other property. And so we realized that with the money, the capital that they had and what we had, we just didn't, we, we didn't, we didn't come, we were about 50% there and we just needed to raise another, you know, million dollars or so. And just we, we knew we couldn't raise enough to buy both. So we let the Georgetown go and we decided to set our focus on uh, the Sable Courts. And that one, again, we raised, I would say, most of the money from the Real Estate Investment Association. However, it wasn't, uh, you know, sort of a windfall of cash is coming or capital coming our way. It was it was a lot of work. It was it was stressful uh, because you do put a large deposit down in order to um, be able to go into contract for this property. And we went into contract and we were still raising money throughout the contract. And there's a 
after 30 days, your deposit becomes non-refundable. You, and, you know, we would lose a large, you know, significant amount of money if we were unable to call together those funds. And so uh, finally, we ended up pulling together monies. You know, I have some of my um, friends or associates that I know that are involved with it. Proud, I'm really proud about that. And um, yeah, finally, we just pulled the trigger and it closed in late 2019 after a lot of due diligence. It's 129 Ooh. units. A lot can go wrong during that time. And, you know, we were able to finesse the, um, uh, the inspections, the appraisals and all of that. So when you, whenever you buy property, you have to have a succinct exit strategy. And our exit strategy with this one really is just to enjoy some of the, um, the appreciation that we'll experience here. I mean, 3% of appreciation on a $9 million asset is a lot, higher than 3% appreciation on a $250,000 asset. Um, we are steadily repositioning the tenant base, which means you know, we're doing renovations. We're trying to get um, somewhat higher end tenants in there so we can just continue to, to, to for it to perform and be profitable. And so, um, yeah, this is still, you know, one in the portfolio. Uh, you have a video there too, it kind of gives a little bit of the scale are you able to share the video? Um, it's it's going, it's lagging when I open up new windows. So let's just talk about this. this okay. And then as people ask questions, I'll pull the video up on the next one. For story. sure. And so that, what you have there on the screen, that's the the model unit we ended up creating. We just kind of gave it the uh, the white cabinets, the you know white or the gray paint on the wall, the gray floor. It's kind of the modern trendy look everyone goes for nowadays. And we are, we're at a point where with the construction crew, they can do this renovation in their sleep. And so they're just, we're just going slow, you know, unit by unit performing these renovations, offering tenants. Um, of course we would, you know, uh, increase the rents um, because in commercial property, you, you do want to increase your net operating income because the value of the property is based on how much income it brings in. Um, so we're constantly trying to either increase rents or increase income and, and or decrease expenses, either one. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's a tough one. It's not one that's easy to manage. This is, I mean, we bought it in late 2019 and then the next year we had the pandemic. And so luckily we're able to, you know, to handle all of our, um, our debt obligations. Um, profit hasn't, you know, been there as much as we'd like to, but I think we're, you know, the hope is these moratoriums start to come to an end and, and we'll start to see some relief on that end and, and it'll perform the way we expect it to. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that. That it did COVID happen the next year. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't think about that. Um, you know, who put together all these numbers? Was that you? Was that your your team? Or who was that that put together these numbers? Yeah, my partner is the, the, the numbers guru. So he has a software where you just enter it in and it spits out this very, you know, immaculate looking summary. Okay. And so... You know, a lot of it is projections. We always project conservatively just in case something goes wrong. We kind of anticipated that. And if everything goes right and awesome, that's just gravy on top. Okay. Okay. And then uh, you said, okay, you had the partner and then you pulled in some other team members uh, and reading your documents, uh, it mentioned uh, an SEC attorney um, for a private place memorandum and some other things on here. Correct. Um, how did you find all these these wonderful smart people to surround yourself with? Right. So the this it's it's called the syndication. When you raise money from a lot of different people, and not everyone is going to have their name on the mortgage. That's that would be considered a security by the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. And so you need an SEC attorney to put this together. We ended up just from our network at the Real Estate Investment Association, just having one sort of in our pocket or in our network. And so we use them. I mean, it's, a, it's quite the expense, but obviously they're doing uh, good work to keep us out of trouble. And sure. it's worth it. No, I like it. I like it. I love it. I love it. Questions, comments, feedback. And then in regards to the 504 SBA program, um, I'm not familiar with I haven't used that program. I haven't used SBA funding uh, ever. Um, I, I, from what I understand, it has something to do with nonprofits. And... Um, 
and, and you know, I'm not sure if you have to be a nonprofit to to seek it out or to successfully uh, so, obtain it or what. Now, with that said, piggybacking on, on that person's question, um, so how do you fund your deal? So, uh, you know, you're raising the, the, the down payment from investors. How do you who actually does the traditional bank financing? Well, a lot of the properties we do, for example, the 38 unit deal, because it was so much, it had so much vacancy and it needed so much renovation. Typically, traditional banks don't want to touch those. Okay. Even in credit unions, they're a little skittish on it. You have to go to, to funds, which are usually either hedge funds or just, you know, people who are flush with capital and they want to okay. deploy that capital and put it to work. And so it's expensive money. It's this hard money in essence. Right. And it's, it's high fees. You know, you're not getting 3% interest rate. Your interest rates are eights, nines, sure. uh, but it's also short-term money. And so right. typically when it comes to commercial, they're, they're evaluating the deal, not so much us. I mean, we also get evaluated, but the deal is the most important. And so if the numbers okay. make sense, then they feel comfortable moving forward. Nice. And it's interesting. Someone uh, taught me that. I actually used to be part of Real Estate Investment Association. Um before I bought my first deals. And I remember them saying the reason why people prefer commercial over residential is because you can't get the financing is dependent on the deal, not the person. Whereas if you buy a residential, you got to use your credit and that bankruptcy right. would count against you. So then, you know, you couldn't ultimately, if you didn't have the cash, it's not big enough for other people to want to put their money up. And right. because your, your personal situation is not sparkly clean in this particular time frame. Um, right. It would make it, you know, very difficult for you to find the deal. So I, that makes a lot of sense. Interesting. Absolutely. And, and there's a saying that, you know, the, if, it's, if there's a good deal out there, money will find it. I believe and, it. Yeah. And this is, you know, one of those scenarios. I believe it. I believe it. All right. Um, Larry Smith, you said, uh, Larry says, how can I find a prop apartment for sale in Georgia? Um, different ways. I mean, you know, wholesalers are a great way to start. Wholesalers are just folks that they are seeking, they're sending out letters all the time. So for example, if, say if you have a house and I'm sure you've gotten letters that say, Hey, do you want to, you know, we buy houses cash or do you want to sell your house? So those are usually wholesalers that are sending out that mail and they're trying to get the motivated seller to, to sell to them at a cheap number at a cheap price. And so what they'll do is they'll put a little bump in the price and then, you know, put it on the marketplace to where investors like me have access to it. And I mean, you find those wholesalers through, you know, I mean, I can send you, a, you know, a couple of wholesalers who um, offer property in Georgia, but um, they're out there. They're out there. Usually if you check out like biggerpockets.com, uh, they might have information on some sellers, on some wholesalers rather, uh, and that sort of thing. Another way to find um, apartments for, for sale is if you want to do that, perform that kind of marketing on your own. So if you want to send that mail out on your own to potentially motivated sellers or to people who own commercial property, which is what I do as well, then you just get the lists and you send mail to them. And sometimes I'll sit here literally handwriting, you know, 150 envelopes, 200 envelopes to send out. Um, but I've gotten deals that way. So it, it, it can pay off. Um, another where another place is Facebook groups. If you go on Facebook, uh, look in their groups, and you'll see you know investors of Georgia or whatever county. Yeah, they usually have a group for those for those um, uh, for those municip for, for those areas, and you just go in there and you just start to network in there as well, and, and you'll find them. Uh oh. Hey Eric, you there? You left us, or did I leave you? I'm here. You there? Oh. Yeah, I am. All right. Yeah, something happened. It froze my on my end. All right. No, no, I love it. That's um, that's good stuff. So, you, so you bought the four unit. Then what was the next deal that you did? Uh, I bought the sixteen. I bought the four. And then yep. I flipped a bunch of properties from 14 to 17. Okay. And then, you know, I accumulated some, some good cash reserves from those flips. 
Um, with those flips, though, one thing I, I warn you about that they don't tell you in those TV shows is Uncle Sam, he has his hand out. And you got to make sure you hold back some of that profit you make to pay Uncle Sam because he's not your uncle for, for real. For real. <laughs> <laughs> He no, that's true. That, you know, I remember a buddy of mine in college, he did a uh he did some stock deals and he made like 150,000. He's like, "Yeah, I got money." And yo, Uncle Sam killed him. Like yeah. It, it was true. like when he went back and put it back in the market and then he didn't have that money anymore. He stood old taxes on the profit he made from the deal that he sold. Wow. Yeah. So he was he became, he was in trouble actually afterwards. Yeah, maybe a payment plan would help him, but it is it's it gets real when that you know five you know four or five digit um, tax bill comes in. You yeah. can't afford it, so you can't afford. Yeah, that's not that's right. not fun. That's not right. fun. Um, that's not fun. And then 2018, I purchased the uh, the 38 unit. Okay. Um, then we purchased the 129 unit. Okay. And uh, I've done a couple of wholesale deals in between. Then just doing you know just again trying to. Um, build up my cash reserves, and we just purchased a 12 unit uh, in Volusia County in Florida last week. We just closed on it. Okay. All right. Someone asked, how does a person get into uh, commercial real estate? This is what Eli suggested. Uh, look That's for your local. Place. That's a good place to start. For sure. That's a good place to start. Now you have, I mean, YouTube nowadays is a lot, you know, it's, it's a great resource. Type that into YouTube. There's a few great coaches out there. One that I follow is Peter Harris. Um, he is a wealth of knowledge. He actually wrote the book, uh, How to Buy Real Estate for Dummies, How to Invest in Real Estate for Dummies. And he's written books for Donald Trump and the whole nine yards. So he's a great resource. There's all, But there's other people out there um, who who buy commercial real estate. And, we, and we, when we talk about commercial real estate, it's not just apartment buildings. Um, we're also talking about retail spaces. We're talking about malls or storage space, storage facilities. We're talking uh, industrial, which right now is a really hot sector because of all the warehousing, all the Amazon warehouses and other similar companies who need that type of space and who are leasing it out. Um, we're talking about land, you know, just about anything that's not, four units of residential and under is considered commercial. Um, so I'd say, you know, definitely just, just immerse yourself in that knowledge and, 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 and yeah, get in there. Cause honestly, just, and I know Eric, you talk about this too. And in, in, in the GovCon community that, um, you know, it takes the same amount of work to uh, execute on a $50 million deal than it does on a $5 million deal. Sure. sure, sure and sure. we can extrapolate that to real estate as well. I mean, the same amount, I mean, it might be a, a few more moving parts in commercial real estate, but right, right. the day, the same fat, the same, um, sort of factors come into play. It's, you know, it's right, a contract, right. it's, it's, um, the title, it's getting a loan, right, it's right. due diligence, it's closing, sure, not sure. in that order, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, no, it yeah, makes a lot of sense. Good. It makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the things that you and I, we, when we were preparing, um, we had a conversation of the day, we actually talked about Airbnb and I told you, I have an Airbnb, I've got two of them. And then you said your friend is doing Airbnb successfully, uh, in Florida as well. Right. Right. And, and so I'm in Orlando and you figure in Orlando, this is the home of, you know, Disney and hotels are everywhere. And so are Airbnbs. It's a competitive space, but. Uh, the way he's approached it and the way he's winning is he's going on the high end route. And oftentimes, you know, folks who can afford three, four hundred dollar price tag a night, usually, um, you know, they'll they'll stay some time and they'll they'll be repeat customers and there is a market for it. And so he has his Airbnb rented. Oh, his average is 70 percent of the month. His his units are rented. Um, his expense ratio is about 30%. So 30% of what he brings in, he's keeping for himself and he's doing really well. And one thing that he always tells me is that, you know, he's like, despite all of these hotels and all these Airbnbs as competitors, you know, there's enough business out here. There's enough, there's enough visitors out here for us all to eat, for us all to have business and for us all yeah, to succeed. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that's, that, that, that's going to be another, another space of mine that I go into fairly soon as well. Right? I know yeah, you're going to yeah. do more. No, I'm not in the high end, but I can tell you that, um, you know, my two Airbnbs, I have like 
90% occupancy, maybe 95, which means I probably should raise the price, <laughs> you know, right? So I got to play with the numbers. So I just did that, you know, I'm playing with the price. But again, you know, when you're first trying it out and then your experience, like, okay, let me see how this thing works. Um, and right. it's, 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 it's been amazing. I mean, I just had someone move in um, literally yesterday and they're staying for three months. Wow. So, um, I get people like, and then this is in the middle of like, this is at in the middle of Florida, like there's a small town, but people come for projects. People come that are working on the construction sites for months at a time. These right. people are working and building a solar, um, factory facility out there in the woods. I guess there's land. So they're there, they're in town just to build, work in a solar, um, uh, facility for the next Excellent. two months. So stuff like that, that we don't know even what's going on in and around our cities and towns, even in small town USA, there's just, there's, like you said, we, we don't, there's not enough hotel, even where places like, okay, Orlando, you say, well, there's so many hotels, but there's so many people. And then in, in a place like where I was at, that small town, there's not enough hotels. <laughs> it's just, right. So and then, and then, yeah, like you said, if you increase the price, you know, you'll still get those, those rentals. Right. Sure. No, no, I mean, the hotels are charging. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're. I'm charging half of what the hotels charge. So maybe I get uh, 60, 70% of their, I might still keep my. Do you manage yours? Do you answer, respond to the questions that come in? So um, I manage those, but um, when I have my other rentals, I had a property manager that managed my, all of my other rentals. So when I had my threeplex, duplexes, and my single family homes, it was all in one city. I had a property manager that managed all of those units, those doors. Gotcha. So right. I didn't, and, I never, I never, I don't even know the people's names. I don't know nothing, right. nothing, right. which is I, great. I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm hands off. I mean, my tenants, I'll go to the property and maybe I'm there to do a repair and they'll ask me who I am. And I just tell them, I'll, I'll never say that I'm the owner. I just say right. that I'm from the property management office and right. I don't want extra questions or complaints coming right. in. But I, I'd have a hard time fielding a bunch of questions from people like, hey, where is the bleach? <laughs> I, I, but, but, you know, I guess you save on costs. It's a balance at the end of the day. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and again, um, you know, and, uh, and that one, one town, I had, um, it was 12 units. So it made sense. Um, and then, and the actual, the, my property manager came to me because when I bought this package, there was a little small store, like a little convenience store that came with it. Right. And he ran that store. So he actually wanted to keep running the store. And um, so I was like, okay, that's fine. Well, Eli, I didn't care about the store. Like, it, you know, right. it's like, it's like this little, it's not, I'm trusting me. It's really like a little, like a corner store type thing. Okay. And so I didn't really care about the store. Um, and so he said, well, I'll, I'll, he goes, I'm from this town. I've lived here. I've worked here. And so he goes, I'll manage all the properties for you, collect the rents, find the tenants. If you don't charge me for the store. I was like, okay. Well, that's fine. I mean, so we actually bartered and it, it, like you said, you negotiate, right? You don't, you don't they tell me, if you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. Right. It's just true. Right. <laughs> terms. Everything is terms, man. Everything is terms. So it worked out. And actually, like you said, we're friends to this day and, um, you know, we help each other in more ways and so it's, it's great, but right. I was actually able to, um, sell off some units and keep some stuff and not have any debt on some other stuff. So it, you know, it works, it worked out great for me. Did you a 1031 any of the profits or? No, I didn't 1031 because, um, I didn't want to be forced to, um, do another deal and, I'm not as savvy as you are in this. So, so, and so, you know, what I've seen with people 1031s was that, um, you know, like you got to find another deal. Right. Six months. <laughs> six months. You got six months to find it. You know, so, you know, you're like, you're like chasing deal after deal. So um, yeah. I didn't, yeah, it was just like, it was, I would really decided to, I want to focus more on government contracting is the I truth. Gotcha. Is I just like I want to double down on this and not have my brain in so many places and so scattered. Yeah. Trying to That's trying to, you know, and that was for me. And so for me, um, you know, where I'm headed with this is much greater than even having, tw you know, twelve unit portfolios. It just it wasn't it it, it didn't make any sense. 
for me. Yeah, I, I think, you know, having your, your base is government contracting where you're bringing in that revenue and sure. then parking your money in real estate where you have right. money work harder for you than anywhere right. else. Right. Man, I think that's the that's the win win right there. And that's so, why I have you on because I you know what I'd like to see people do ultimately is again, um, which I've seen like even with podcasters and and people who do courses and sell courses, everyone ends up parking their money in real estate. <laughs> right. Everyone right. who's successful in one, and again, if it's trucking, uh, I got Nikki on here, she does uh construction, so they take that, and even Maria, like I, I encourage her like to take and park your earnings, your money into real estate. And so, you know, um, I, I can tell you, like you said, I don't, real estate is my stocks. Well, other people do stocks and crypto, sure. that's my real estate. And, and it's, I, and listen, I like stocks. I like crypto as well. I, I would never knock those asset classes. No. I just happen to be partial to real estate for a couple of right. reasons. One is, um, you know, you have insurance on or the market tanks or whatever. I mean, you, you have insurance, um, or if you suffer some sort of calamity or storm or whatever, insurance is there to help you. Uh, whereas, whereas if Enron goes down, you know, you're, you're kind of screwed. Um, two, you can, you, you, um, you benefit from appreciation, which usually isn't forecast. It's just a, ter a cherry on top. Um, three, you benefit from forced appreciation. And that's where you're actually fixing the property, the apartment, for example, and you can get higher rent. Uh, for those repairs or for those for that rehab. And so that also increases the price of the asset. Um, and then four, you also have depreciation, which is a tax strategy where you can um, use that depreciation number and offset it, offset your income. So you'll be taxed at a lower basis. So, you know, those are all sort of benefits of real estate that stocks, crypto don't have. But, um, you know, it's pros and cons to everything. Sure. No, I love it. Um so let's answer some questions here. My man, Giant Hawaiian, what's the expectation with the future of retail space? Uh, man, that's, you know, 2019 retail was the place to go. And then COVID happened and it was the place to avoid. <laughs> and, um, I remember in 2019, when you have the likes of JCPenney, Sears, those guys going out of business, the, fo the focus was shifting to you want to have experiential, what they call experiential real estate, which was, you know, maybe have a playground there or something else that would attract people that that an experience that you couldn't get from buying things online. I mean, people are going to go out and shop anyway. Might as make it might as well make it well worth their time. Um, and then COVID hits and it's like, well, so much for experiential real estate because you can't even be around each other within six feet of each other. So um, I, I think that it's it's got a it's got a future. People are always going to eat out. People are always going to go shopping, retail therapy, that kind of thing. Um, will it be as prevalent? Will the market shift? Sure. I don't think. I mean, obviously, malls seem to be if you are not in a, sort of a high end, top of the tier mall, you know, you're, you're, you're struggling right now. And um, I think that'll continue. Um, but I think that, you know, retail is evolving. For example, there's this new concept called um where they have all these restaurants, it's like a food court. And you go into these spaces and there's different types of restaurants, eateries that are around and you can eat sort of in a general space. So it's evolving, I believe. Um, I just think you have to think about it differently and um, you know, just be careful with it. But you know, if you can think a little bit ahead of the curve, the outside the box, then I think retail you know, is, is still steady. And as an owner, one good thing about retail is that they have what's called triple net lease. So, for example, if I have Starbucks as one of my tenants, um, Starbucks is not only paying their lease rate, but they're paying water, electricity, they're paying insurance, they're paying to clean the grounds, they're paying everything. I just supply a box, a building. Um, so there are benefits. You just have to right, have good tenant base and um, you know think outside the box. All right. All right. Nikki says, do you mentor? Oof. Well, um, <laughs> as of today, I, I, I don't. But, um, you know, I think, you know, Eric wants to talk about doing something like that. So I, I'd be open to it. All right. Good stuff. All right. Yes, Craig, you are late. What's going on, Mark? Welcome, brother, to the party. Um, let's see. Has anyone looked at the big box stores and turning them into indoor yes. communities? Yep. Yes. Um, that's called repurposing. Repurposing real estate, I think, is the future. So a lot of those big Sears, big box stores, Kmart's, right, they're just going to sit there 
And oftentimes they're in communities that they're sort of a blight to the area. And, you know, in order to repurpose that big box store into, say, um, I've seen people do it with apartments where they would bring in um, storage containers and have the storage containers as like mini apartments, you know, anywhere from four to 800 square feet, um, put them on one side, put restaurants on the other side. I've seen people get really creative. And all you need to do is just, you know, go on YouTube and just write in, you know, repurposing real estate and you'll see a lot of the, the, the different ideas people are doing. But um, yeah, big box is, is, is struggling and uh, that'll continue. All right. Are you able to purchase commercial real estate in your company name or does it have to be personally guaranteed? I prefer you buy it in a company in an LLC. You don't okay. want to personally guarantee it because obviously, you know, it's a lot more liability. Um, you expose not only yourself, but, you know, some of your other assets, if they're not held in LLCs as well. So always, you know, buy them in LLCs or they even have land trust, which is a another way of sort of hiding, you know, hiding your real estate from um, from the public eye. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that's that's really the way to go. I know people that do land trust. Yeah. 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 I've seen them do land trust. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, is it true that commercial leases give the landlord the option to make the tenant pay the tax insurance and the cost of repairs? Yes, those are, again, those are called triple net lease. Um, NNN is how it's abbreviated and the tenant pays everything. Uh, they'll pay your taxes, they'll pay your maintenance, they'll pay your lawn care, they pay everything. But usually those are tenants that have credit or have sort of a national, regional or national presence. You, you're not going to be able to get a barbershop or, you know, beauty salon to those kind of terms. All right. Uh, like Nikki said, make sure everyone hits the like button. Um, and then my man Johnny says, I've been on Beta Sam, real estate leasing. Have you done any of those opportunities before? You know, I was I was working that angle. And um, I, I have a challenge. I've, it, it depends on the actual um, agency that you or the office that you work with. So, for example, in Florida, um, I forget the agency that does it. Um, they're based in Atlanta. It escapes me now. But um, in Florida, the agency wanted you to either own the property or for you to be or for the owner to put you in as a partner. Of that I think I remember you emailing me about something like that. JV, yeah, and so that made it difficult for us because the the owner of the property they didn't want to add right. us at, on as a partner, you know, for their uh, for their establishment, and I understood why. Um, and that was difficult. However, I worked with the USDA one time in I want to say Quincy, Florida, which is uh, west of Tallahassee, and there they wanted a space for their new offices. And, you know, they were willing to work with us, even though we didn't own the property. We were, I was brokering it, really, sure. for a mm -hmm. monthly stipend, if you will. However, yep. Yep. the rate at which we were wanting to lease it at was too high for the USDA. They didn't want to pay okay. that much on okay. it. It was like $30 per okay. okay. square foot or something. All right. Fair mm -hmm. enough. Um, man says, can we get more information about land trust? Sure. Land trust is um, is really a way to shield your assets from the public eye. So, for example, if you do a search in the county records uh, for and you're trying to find information on me, let's say you slip and fall and you go to an attorney. Right. And the attorney says, OK, we're going to get this owner because he owes you money. The insurance company only wants to pay so much. And so you decide to come after me because I'm the owner of the LLC. Um, and then you see that own other assets or you're trying to find other assets that I own. You could just do a search for my name or anything of that nature. But if my assets are in a land trust, it's really difficult for you to sort of pierce that land trust in order to get into it, to find out that I own the land trust. Now, if you were to go, let's say, to, a, you know, to sue me and we go to court, it's a long drawn out case and they end up subpoena, doing a subpoena and trying to get that information. Yes, they can pierce that sort of veil that you have protecting your land trust. But um, with that exception, you know, you won't be able to, to find out who owns that land trust. Um, as a matter of fact, I would say go into the county records and the property appraisers office and, and look through some of those land trusts and you just won't you won't find it. Gotcha. 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 Um, Eli, are you okay with me dropping your email in here? 
Uh, sure, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I, I kind of put you on the spot, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> A little bit too late, right? It's like a picture of the spot. All right, what else? What else? Uh, hold on. Go back. Yes. Is it true that commercial real estate is valued by the profitability and term of the leases? So every time you responsibly raise the rents, you increase the property value. Correct. Correct. And so in every property that we go to, um, we, we prefer to buy what's known as value add deals. And value adds just means that there's some um, room for you to increase rents. So, for example, uh, the one that we purchased in uh, in Florida last week, the rents there are about 600 to 625 for one bedrooms, one baths. Okay. This is actually a nice area. I would call it, you know, on a scale of, you know, A to, to, to C or to D, A being the nicest. Um, it would be like a B, like a B minus is, you know, older community, the infrastructure is a little more mature, older, you know, more mature trees and things of that nature. But those rents can go up to about a thousand dollars, maybe more, depending on how nicely and how well we do those renovations. So the price that we bought it at, it was reflective of the rents that they were collecting. And so if we raise the rents from 600 to a thousand dollars, which is almost, you know, that's over 50 percent uh, increase. Um, it now represents a, a really nice new, like a new net operating income number that's a lot higher. That's over 50 percent higher than what we bought it at. And so when we go back and try and sell it or refinance it or pull some equity out, you know, we're going to see a similar increase in the value of that property. How many units? How many units was it? Uh, it's 12. 12 okay, units. 12 units. Okay, I got you. And now, how did you find that deal? Um, again, through a wholesaler. A wholesaler right. sent us a text, and we didn't we didn't think much of it. And all of a sudden, my my you know my partner sends you know he calls me. He's like, hey man, I think there might be some meat on this bone. And I'm like, sure. So we reviewed it, and I was like, I think there is some meat on this bone. I think there is a value here. And so we literally that same day they had a showing. It might have been 1 p.m. at the time. Um, that we reached out to the wholesaler and the showing ended at three and it's about an hour 15 minutes away from me so i hopped in my car i drove out there i told him hey, look man we'll be you know 20 minutes late but i'll be there sure enough we walked through some of the apartments and i loved it it's, it's nothing that really needs to be done except cosmetic work just again you know gray floors gray paint uh, we call it gentrification gray um, you know, <laughs> cabinet facings, you know, landscaping, maybe painted right. interior and, and you're good and you can raise that rent. And, you know, I, it's, I, I'm sensitive to raising rent on, on folks, but at least we're providing a value. Right. And honestly, right. We're, we're bringing it up to market value. So we're not doing anything excessive. Now, when you do something like that, okay. And you say, Hey, okay. There's something on the bones. Does everyone have to have money? Like, do you have to have money to get in the deal? How does that work? Wow, great question. Because I mean, I just you don't want to hear talk about money. Like, I can't believe you got 48 people watching this, and no one's like, look, like, do I have to bring 50 G's to the table? Do I have to bring 100 G's to the table? So, like, y'all, yeah. y'all, nobody's curious about money out there. Like, I mean, I'm just saying, I want to know about the money set. I got to write so a check, check you know, like, how does yeah. that work? And, and so, we have you and I haven't even talked about this, so you didn't I know. know. No one said it. Um, no, and no one's asked the question. I'm sitting here racking my brain, and no, right. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for someone in the audience to say, "Hey, look, how much money? How much money?" So right. you know, you got a 14 unit deal. Do I have to put up two hundred thousand? Do I have to put up a half a million? What like what do I have to do to get in the right. you know? So typically, when we did, for example, when we did the raise for the uh, the 129, yeah, the 129 unit deal, we had a minimum of a hundred thousand dollars. So with that allowed. Correct each. Okay. And what that allowed for was we don't we don't want to have too many investors because it becomes it's just more challenging. Sure. Investors have personalities. I mean, this is a lot of money, so you're fielding calls and concerns and things of that nature. So you almost have to vet each other when we are in that position. We don't want someone okay. who can just be a pain and you know really really just brings down everyone's energy. Uh, so typically we do, we don't always do hundred thousand dollar minimums, but because that was a large raise. Yeah. That's a million dollar raise. It was, it was $2 million, $2 million raise. So oh, we two had, million. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we had a few folks that came in, they were well-funded, uh, well-capitalized and they brought in a lot more than a hundred thousand, but that was the minimum. 
Okay. Uh, however, okay. for this 12 unit deal, my partner, he's, you know, he's campaign, he can talk paint off a wall and he's really gifted. <laughs> and um, he had an investor who was just, again, eager to deploy some capital. And that investor brought the entire down payment, Eric, the entire thing. And in essence, my partner and I, we didn't spend anything. Now, I'm but doing- you did the due diligence, you found the deal, you put everything correct. together. My, right. my partner, yeah, correct. In that regard, yes. My partner did a lot of the due diligence. He found the deal. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of the renovation or leading the efforts, you know, sure. sort of project managing the renovation, making sure I manage the uh, property manager as well. And, um, you know, making sure we get in the top rents and things of that nature. So sure. it's a collected efforts where I'm still working, but, you know, he's I'm putting in sweat equity and that gentleman put in the equity. equity. I can't believe y'all. didn't. First of all, for the 47 people who stayed on to catch that, I'm glad you stayed on. For the people who missed it, I'm sorry you missed it. <laughs> you had to run. And, and I'm glad that I asked the question because no one asked that question. He did not put up any money. Right. So I'm just saying. He didn't put yeah. any money. By the way, Eli, what's interesting, we're going to talk like, you know, these people are not even on with us. I have a guy like that now that says the same thing. He'll put up the money. I just have to find a deal. So um, yeah. I've got someone like that now that I've met through the government contracting world because of me doing government contracting and he uh, working together, you know, doing business and doing, you know, we've done millions of dollars in government contracts. So we have a relationship. And so he's like, look, Eric, you know, find us a deal. I'll put up the money and we'll split up the deal and, you know, um, just put something together, put the numbers together and send it to me. So um, I've got right. someone like that now, right now. Awesome. Well, I mean, if you need some help finding a deal, let me know. I'll, I'll shoot some stuff your way and, you know, we could all partner on that. There you go. Like Giant says, sorry, Eric, I was using your money. Yeah, I know y'all would count my money. <laughs> Listen, the whole point of the discussion, right, is so that we can leverage. Uh, you know, we're leveraging uh, Eli's knowledge and his expertise. Uh, you're le leveraging my platform. And then, you know, there's people that have capital and we're leveraging that. And so we're just, again, I think uh, this collaboration is, is definitely bigger than what we've all probably taken advantage over the last two decades. I mean, we'd probably all be in a different place if we had done this, you know, 20 years ago. So, um, but I'm glad we're having a conversation. I'm glad we're talking about it now. Uh, let's see, someone asked, is it easier now for black and brown people to purchase commercial real estate or is it still a barrier? I mean, I think, I think he answers the question by his own examples, but I'll let Eli take this one. Right, I mean, I think, <sighs> I haven't, I'm sure, I mean, I don't know. I can't say that there haven't been any barriers because of that, but I mean, I just, I've, I've seen a lot more other barriers. I mean, I had a bankruptcy to overcome, so I was more worried about that more so than worrying about, you know, other barriers that I might not be able to prove. So, you know, to answer your question, I, I went, I hit that real estate investment association hardcore. I would say 90% of the people in there, you know, don't look like me. And at the end of the day, you know, some folks you'll vibe with, you'll connect with, and you can do deals with others, you know, they'll, they'll just never um, accept you. And that, and it goes for, you know, any, any race, any gender, whatever. Right. So right. I wouldn't let that stop you. I would, if anything, I would use it as encouragement, um, as a bigger obstacle to overcome if that is something that you think you're, you're facing. But um, I think at the end of the day, Deals are deals. The money, the 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 the, money, the numbers are what talk the most when it comes right. to deals, right. Right. and right. Uh, that's what you want to focus on. And also, you, you don't know, need you everyone, need everyone right? right? You don't, you don't need everyone to to do this. You know, um, you get your circle of people that you're working with, and uh, you know maybe some of them can have are more likable and, and more trustworthy, and and they could lend the credibility of you and the and the deals. So you know that's just been my experiences. Is I don't. I don't try to appeal to everyone. Um, I always, I always like to say this, and I know it's probably a bad joke, but um, in truth, uh, 70 million people voted for Donald Trump, right? And then 7 million people voted for Joe Biden. So you don't have to appeal to everyone. You just got to appeal to a group, a group of people that help you accomplish what you're trying to get accomplished. Um, someone says, have you ever used equity waterfall in your deals? Um. I haven't had anyone. Um, uh, when, you, when you're saying equity waterfall, I'm thinking you're talking about like the capital stack. So, 
um, the type of uh, avenues I've used to 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 raise money for a deal or to uh, to represent my down payment. Um, I haven't. I've just used capital from other investors and or for myself and investors. And um, and that's how we carried we, we executed them. I didn't um, leverage another property that I owned. I've had the op opportunity to, but I just never have. Hope that answers your question. Uh, do you use a lot of real estate financial models when presenting the numbers to investors? Do you have to excel financial modeling skills? Yeah, Craig is an investor apparently, but uh, <laughs> um, I I don't I know the the financial modeling sort of charts and software you're you're, you're talking about. Really, no, because that's very technical. And if they need to see a little bit more insights, then sure, I'll show them that. But for example, if you were on earlier and, and, and uh, Eric, you saw Eric as he showed the summary of our deal, uh, it, it, it's more informative as far as you know a lot of the sort of the vision for the property, uh, the exit strategy. We talk about the loan, the, the numbers, um, and I believe it was a spreadsheet, like a simple. Um, financial modeling spreadsheet that they took kind of screenshot that put it onto the summary and, and we use that. Um, but it's not too, you don't want to get too intense because not all the investors aren't as savvy as you might be, you know, they may know, you know, basics and you want to keep it at their level. Sure. All right. We're going to do uh, two more questions and we're going to sign off and be respectful of everyone's time today. If you have not already hit the like button, please hit the like button, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, hit the like button, um, please. That will help us be able to provide you with more content like this. Also, again, um, if you like this kind of content, leave us leave a comment in the show notes, um, feedback. I put uh, Eli's information in here and whatever additional information that he provides to me, I will also make that available to everyone as well who's listening. So two more questions. This one from one shot says, what if I get a transactional loan? What would that work for commercial properties? Uh, from my understanding of a transactional loan, those are more like really short term from what I've, from when I've tried to use them, it was about maybe 48 hours, maybe a week long or something just to buy something. And then uh, maybe do a quick, um, a, a double close or something to that extent. Um, if that's what you're referring to, I, I, I never have tried that. So I, I don't know. You know, I don't want to give you a wrong answer on that. Um, I've done, I've wholesaled properties where, you know, I've done um, not a double close, but I've assigned the contract. So I didn't need a loan. Um, you know, if you did a double close, you might've needed a, a transaction loan, but I've never used it for a commercial. Nice, nice. nice, nice. Um, and then uh, since uh, I don't see any more questions up there, um, do you consider yourself exceptional? <laughs> Ooh, man, what a, that's loaded. I mean, look, in I my mean, mind, you know, I, listen, I mean, that's part of my, my daily affirmations. So I'm, okay. I'm going to say yes on that one. All right. Um, I'm not going to say I'm anything less. Good. No, no. I mean, again, I, I just, um, you know, I, I, for me, I think that uh, it's almost like, Again, if I didn't come on and I didn't share, you know, the word and the things that I knew, you got, you know, people would not see um, me and the person like me that's doing this kind of stuff. And, and I feel the same way with you and your talents and your skills, which is why I have you on here to showcase, um, like the man says, or, you know, black and brown people doing these kind of things. I feel like, you know, hell, I know someone that does it. Let me bring them on and, sh and showcase that to folks. Because, again, when you see people that look like you, sound like you, talk like you, doing these things, you're encouraged and motivated. You're like, okay, this is a possibility. And it's real. Sure. And, right. and, and I know it's real. And I've been around you. And, you know, we've met. And it's um, so I know it's real. But go ahead. You were going to say something. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, I, I say yes to that question. I mean, I don't mean to come off as cocky or anything like that. But um, that's just the way that I, I, I train myself to think. But, I mean, this is something that anybody can do. I mean, I was a C student in college, and, you know, I've had all kinds of struggles on top of that. I got a whole list, but uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, but it's just persistence, persistence, resilience, you know, not taking no, getting shot down, and, you know, just getting over it quick and continuing to go. That's really that's really my flow right there. And uh, 
I'm kind of like one of those I work hard guys, you can't outwork me kind of guys. And uh, that's how that's what's worked for me. And again, for all the people who keep asking, where, how do you get started? The Real Estate Investment Association is uh, where Eli first started out. Look for your local real estate investment association. They're in every city. Am I correct, Eli? Every major yep. city. Every, every major one. city has one. Look for the, the Real Estate Investment Association. Uh, it's a great place. He said that at the time he paid $150 a year to join annually, which is 365 calendar days. And then they offer courses that you can take ranging from 50 bucks, a couple hundred bucks. And then uh, you took one that was, I think you said 5,000. Correct. For a mentor, right? For a mentor though, that was for actual mentorship. So again, but that $5,000 that you pay for the mentorship, got you a four unit building with seller financing that has now increased over $200,000 in value. So 5,000 turns into 200,000. I think it's, you did pretty good. Correct. Correct. <laughs> um, Facebook groups is another place to go. You can again, search Facebook groups in your locality and your, you know, your County, your city, and there's usually groups, and there's usually you know people local that are doing deals or, or experts that can help as well. Um, YouTube's got a ton of great information. Like I said earlier, Peter Harris is a great place for commercial real estate investing knowledge. He's a um, a middle aged brother. He's actually really good, and uh, it's a lot of content out there. Peter Harris for commercial real estate investing. All right, I'm going to leave them with that. All right. So Peter Harris for Commercial Real Estate Investing. Uh, it's another great place to go to as a resource. So again, hey, listen, thank you so much for watching. Eli, um, don't get lost. We'll keep in contact. We're like two hours away. <laughs> uh, thank you, guys. My man Kwame, you know, uh, always trying to share with people the knowledge, always trying to spread the good word out here. Uh, give people options. Let them know what's possible, right? You know, because, again, you might make money over in this other space and you say, look, I got a couple of dollars I want to play with and, you know, um, now you have a resource to turn to. So, hey, look forward to uh, if you want to hear more topics like this, let us know. Send me an email. Send us, leave us some comments. Um, definitely willing to open up to discussing other things, uh, especially things that I'm interested in. So this is this is a great call. Uh, great information. Great questions. Thank you. Thank you, Eli, as always. Yeah. And everyone have a great night. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the opportunity, Eric. Appreciate you. Right. Always a pleasure.